In this video, we're going to be talking all about glycolysis and everything you need to know to answer any glycolysis question on the test. So let's just go over real quick a couple different question types. So there will be questions on the stages of glycolysis, on carbon counting, on the fates of pyruvate, on the specific enzymes within the stages of glycolysis, the Cori cycle, and energy math. I will say that in terms of carbon counting in the stages of glycolysis, I found that you don't really need to understand the biochemical structure, like be able to draw the structure of these things. So don't like stress out worrying about that. So just as a quick overview, glycolysis is going to occur in the cytoplasm and one glucose gets turned into net two ATP and two NADH. And then we're going to start with six carbons and we're going to end up with two three carbon molecules named pyruvate. So we can break glycolysis into two main stages, the energy use phase and the payoff phase. In the energy use phase, we're going to use two ATP and that's in steps one and three. And then the second part is the payoff phase. That's when we get our ATP. So we get four ATP. So I have a little math equation here. So we gain four, but we use two. So we net plus two ATP per glucose. So we use ATP in step one and three. And the way I remember that is I think of babies. And the way I remember that is I think that babies eat the most food at one and three years old. And so when they're first born, they're like, wow, this food is amazing. And then by age two, they're like, eh, you know, getting kind of bored of it. And then by year three, they're like, oh man, this stuff is amazing again. And then by year three, they realize how amazing food is again. And these are going to be kinase enzymes. So step one, we've got hexokinase. In the liver, it's called glucokinase. And then step three is PFK, phosphofructokinase. And I put a little star here because this is a very important enzyme. If you're going to be asked a question about a glycolysis enzyme, it's likely going to be this one. And so this is a rate limiting enzyme and we'll spend some time on this one in another slide. Now we're going to be spending a little bit of time on the fates of pyruvate. And the way I have organized this is I have one slide for the main fates of pyruvate. And then I have a second slide for kind of secondary fates of pyruvate. So pyruvate can be turned into a lot of things. And you're mainly asked about these things here. And so I've labeled this as the main fates of pyruvate. So with pyruvate, if you have oxygen present, the pyruvate proceeds to become acetyl-CoA, and then it jumps into the Krebs cycle or fatty acid synthesis. And then you have low oxygen. In an anaerobic environment, it can go two ways. So pyruvate can either become lactic acid or ethanol, depending on the organism. So if it's bacteria, it becomes lactic acid. If it's yeast, it becomes ethanol. And then in the human body, in muscle cells that are being exercised and have a lack of oxygen, we see lactic acid production too. And then some secondary fates of pyruvate. Pyruvate can go on to become oxaloacetate, and this is a reaction in gluconeogenesis. And then it can also go on to become alanine. And if you remember the amino acid lecture, pyruvate can actually become a couple different amino acids, but I'm really just including alanine because it's the main one. And so uh, the way I remember this is alan eats ox pie. And so ox for oxaloacetate and pie for pyruvate. So here's a summary of the fates of pyruvate. So we've got lactic acid. That enzyme is called lactate dehydrogenase. Now, I, I listed here the Cori cycle, which is something that we're going to cover later on. So we'll get to that. And it's mainly seen with bacteria. And then ethanol is yeast. And sometimes you'll see this described as alcohol fermentation. And then with acetyl-CoA, that's produced by the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase. And one thing to keep in mind is this happens in the mitochondria. And I'll cover this later here, but just real briefly, this step, pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, we're no longer dealing with glycolysis, and it doesn't happen in the cytosol, it happens in the mitochondria. Oxaloacetate, this reaction, pyruvate to oxaloacetate, occurs in gluconeogenesis, and remember, Alan eats ox pie. Here's a little table that just kind of uh, reviews a lot of that stuff I just went through, and then I list the enzymes here and the type of reaction, and then a little fun fact about it. So if you like, you can pause it and, and take a look at this. And now we're going to talk about carbon counting, and we've kind of already talked about it a little bit. And so I have this list here, which I don't want you to get too overwhelmed by, but I'm just going to walk you through how I'm structuring this. So we start with glucose. So we start with glucose, and then after step one, this is the product, G6P, glucose 6-phosphate. And then after step two, etc., all the way down to step 10. And in parentheses here, I've got two 
and that's because now we have two of these molecules here. So at this point, we've got two three carbon molecules. So which step do we go from six carbons to three carbons? Step four, did you get it? I'm so proud of you, good job. Okay, step three, PFK, this is a big boy. So we definitely need to know a lot about phosphofructokinase. So remember, this is the rate limiting step of glycolysis. It's the committed irreversible step. So after step three, we're gonna proceed all the way with glycolysis. Step three makes ATP and remember,